blossom-covered hedges and emerging new leaves are a sure sign that spring is well underway. But what better seasonal indicator is there than the iconic bluebell? These vibrant bulbs form carpets of colour in woodlands across the country, creating popular tourist sites. Did you know there are two species of bluebell found in the UK? The Spanish bluebell and the native common bluebell. Each has its own characteristics. The native bluebell has bells on one side of the stem, whereas the Spanish is heavy with them all around the stem. However, these two species can hybridise, which is causing conservation difficulties as the hybrids take over the native habitat. And believe it or not, picking one of these wildflowers could result in a fine of up to £5,000. Spring is a really important time in the farming calendar, with livestock giving birth and early silage being made. At Bittlesbrook Farm, they're coming to the end of lambing their small flock of Welsh mules, so Natalie has been documenting this important event. Sheep are great at giving us clear indicators when they're about to give birth. So they'll lie on their sides, they might stare at their bellies, look up at the sky. Um, you'll quite often see them licking their lips in preparation for cleaning off their newborn lamb. Um, these are all signals that we look out for when we come up and check on the sheep um, and they tell us exactly which sheep are going to lamb. Natalie and Clyde's flock has been crossed with a Suffolk ram to breed a sturdy, hardy lamb which will produce a high meat yield. Clive has been working hard to create a sheltered area in the barn for newborn lambs. Many commercial farmers will lamb indoors, whereas others prefer the traditional method of outdoor lambing. This year, Clive and Natalie have decided to compromise between the two. As a general rule, we'll always lamb outdoors. It's considered most hygienic, uh, it's less stressful for the ewe, and it's the most natural situation for them to be in while giving birth. That said, last year, sadly, we did lose some lambs. We lost them to the fox, and we also lost a couple during difficult births where they really needed assistance, and we simply couldn't get there on time. So this year, we've compromised. We've set up this barn so that at night, we bring the ewes in here, so they're nice and sheltered, really protected. We can come up and check on them regularly through the night and make sure that there aren't any problems. And then during the day, they're out in a nice big green field. They've got plenty of grass, and the lambs can all gamble around together. This year many of the sheep have had difficulty lambing and needed a helping hand, like this ewe who gave birth to one lamb in the field but was struggling with the second. Having given birth to her first lamb naturally in the field, I kept an eye on the ewe and she did quickly start to show signs of distress, discomfort, something was obviously not quite right, so I ended up bringing her into a pen so I could do an internal examination where I found that the second lamb was actually breached so it was coming hind legs first as opposed to head and front feet first. This can pose complications and it can even cause suffocation so it's important to handle it correctly. Thankfully though it was a fairly straightforward delivery and the lamb was up and drinking in no time after having a bit of a clean off. After spending a night in the barn, the lambs and mums are moved to a small outdoor pen before heading into the big field. The barn is cleared out and disinfected in preparation for the next birth. So lambing season's always really hard work and um, really busy and we always have our own little problems that crop up each year and these four <laughs> happen to be one of those problems in that one of our ewes had four babies, which is really unusual. Um, and we've never had it before, but it means that she's not producing enough milk to feed all of them. So these two are being bottle fed. <laughs> these bottle fed lambs are growing in strength and becoming more sociable every day. Soon they'll be weaned and will rely on the green pasture to nourish them, just like their mums. Great things about the farm are the diverse and various habitats located there. These are what make it so special and ecologically exciting. So why not try introducing these habitats into your own garden to encourage more wildlife? Okay, so it might be pretty difficult to build yourself a brook, but one of the other thriving habitats can be surprisingly easy to introduce into your garden. Ponds. Every pond on the farm is brimming with wildlife, as we showed in episode 2. Wouldn't it be great to bring this into your own garden? 
First, you're gonna to have to choose your spot. The site should get enough sunlight, but not light all day long, so some shade would be ideal. Your pod need not be big. An old washing up bowl or a large plant pot will suffice. However, I'm gonna use this spare recycling bin. Now it's time to start digging. I used a spade to mark a rough outline of my container and then remove the top layer of turf. Do not dispose of this as you'll need it later to line the outer rim of your pond. I then dug down into the dirt until I created a hole deep enough and wide enough for the bin to snugly fit in. So after you've dug your hole and got the container into it, you're going to want to create a substrate on the bed of the container. Uh, so for that you're going to need gravel or loose stones. Uh, what you're going to want to do is go ahead and tip them in. Like so. You're also going to want to add in larger stones and rocks into your pond to create hiding places and also a slope to allow creatures to easily get in and out. I then use stones and shells to decorate the edge of my pond before filling it with rainwater from my water butt. Finally, the finishing touch, a few locally sourced pond plants. So that's it, it's ready. Wildlife will come naturally, so watch and wait. Try not to introduce any species as you may spread disease. Any pond can become a feeding ground for birds, hedgehogs and even bats, which all just happen to be the best natural garden pest controllers. So the pond may actually benefit your flower beds and vegetable patches. This April has been unseasonably warm, with temperatures regularly reaching over 20 degrees. This heat has prompted ecological shifts, with flowers blooming early and some insects appearing sooner than expected. Reptiles are a key group of animals who rely on warm weather to function, and the weather may have brought this surprise visitor to my garden. So this morning I came out to check the pond, mainly to see if the water was still in it, so I didn't quite trust my engineering skills, but I have to, have to say it's all good. But look at this guy. Can you believe it? This is a grass snake. It's one of four UK species of snakes. They're exclusive amphibian hunters. They are non-venomous to us, however they can still bite, so I would recommend not trying to handle these guys unless you have snake handling experience. I've lived here for 25 years and I've never seen one here. How amazing is that? I can't say for sure that it was a pond that attracted it, but I'd like to think it was. What an incredible couple of weeks it's been for wildlife. Since filming the grass snake in my garden, another snake was spotted on the farm, basking beside the stream. What are the chances? You never know when exciting wildlife is going to present itself to you, so always keep an eye out, whether from your kitchen window or while out on a walk, you might just see something amazing. I couldn't believe my luck this week. While on a walk with my dog, I glimpsed the water bowl swimming in the local river. Spring has brought with it an explosion of life, so we've decided to keep you updated with our wildlife encounters and footage from our camera traps in special new episodes, the first of which will be available to watch next Friday. So make sure you've subscribed to our YouTube channel for future videos. Stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy nature.